Hi everyone, welcome to our discussion uh, on lesson 2. Lesson 2 is laboratory bio-risk management. So patient specimen is a major source of infectious pathogens that are considered as biohazards. These infectious pathogens are also considered as bio-risks which may pose danger to the medical technologist or the laboratory staff. Aside from affecting the medical technologist, it can also affect other lab specimens as it may contaminate them, leading to errors in results. In most laboratories in our country, bio-risk management is not given much emphasis, probably because there is no law yet that mandates its creation. That's why it is important to learn more about bio-risk management to assess if the control measures in the laboratory are working as expected. Our lecture for today is all about laboratory bio-risk mitigation strategies authored by Ms. Joy Potencialo Calayo, Chief Medical Technologist of San Lazaro Hospital Central Laboratory. This lecture was presented by her during the past math PHPBA workshop. These are the following references used as sources for the presentation. This slide shows you the outline or the flow of the different topics under BRM or Biorisk Management uh, although it's quite a lengthy lecture, but I hope that you will bear with me. In this slide, we see news about SARS when it was discovered back in 2004. The outbreak of SARS during that time started in a laboratory where a scientist who was handling infectious agents such as the West Nile virus accidentally cross-contaminated it with SARS-CoV due to inappropriate procedures. Also, Environmental samples positive with SARS were isolated from the handle of an alcohol spray bottle and switch panel cabinet which actually came from a spillage of material. So why do we need to have bio-risk management? The answer is simple. We have to control safety and security risks brought about by handling or storage and even disposal of biological agents and toxins in laboratories and related facilities. BRM is needed to prevent the spread of infectious pathogens that may cause an outbreak and affect a bigger portion of the human population. So now, let's define some terms related to BRM. First, we have bio-risk, which is the risk associated with biological materials in the lab which has a safety and security component. First is laboratory biosafety. Lab biosafety includes containment principles, technologies, and practices implemented to prevent unintentional exposure to pathogens and toxins, or their unintentional release. In short, um, it is protecting people from dangerous pathogens. That's the purpose of your laboratory biosafety. We also have laboratory biosecurity which is the institutional and personal security measures designed to prevent loss theft, misuse, or intentional release of pathogens and toxins. In short, um, it is protecting pathogens from dangerous people. Remember that infectious pathogens can also be used as agents of biological warfare. We also define laboratory bio-risk management, which is a system or process to control safety and security risks associated with handling, storage, and disposal of biological agents and toxins in laboratories and facilities. So, we don't just get rid of these uh, infectious agents right away. We need to follow proper protocols to prevent any untoward incident that may result from being careless and ignorant. The next slide shows you the several components of bio-risk management program as found in the International Standard CWA15793 series of 2008, which was created by the European for Standardization. The goal of this program is the improvement of the organization's effectiveness and efficiency by means of identifying, understanding, and managing a system of interrelated processes in which biosafety plays a big role. A successful bio-risk management system 
depends on the solid commitment by top management, which shall provide the adequate resources and priorities and shall make continual improvement an objective for every individual in the organization. This includes periodic assessment, promoting prevention activities, and training and recognizing or rewarding this improvement. The functions of CWA are the following. First, establish and keep a bio-risk management system to control and minimize risk to acceptable levels by means of tools and systems. Provide assurance that the requirements are in place. Request and achieve a certification of verification of the management system by an independent third party. And provide a basis for training and raising awareness of biosafety and biosecurity guidelines. Now, what are the roles of a manager in BRM? Managers should have the ability to conduct evaluation risks and selecting which mitigation measures are to be used. He or she should be decisive enough to arrive at a certain decision that would provide an outcome, may it be good or bad. A good BRM manager supports and prioritizes the ideas of his employees in terms of projects and implements control measures for the welfare of its constituents. There are two perceptions of risk by a manager. The manager can be risk tolerant, which means he is willing to endure the loss as a result of his decision. There is also a manager who is risk averse, which means he or she is someone who is afraid to make decisions or reluctant to decide whether to risk something or not. His management decisions are greatly influenced by the following factors. Financial, political, cultural, we also have communication and even geography. These factors affect how a BRM manager perceives risks. In this slide, we can see the laboratory biosafety and biosecurity integration flowchart. What we can deduce from here is that both biosafety and biosecurity risks influence the laboratory management to create measures for laboratory biosafety and biosecurity, and these two are very important in the laboratory biorisk management through an integration process. When there are risks involved, control measures are put into place to equalize this risk. All of these make up the laboratory biorisk management. What we can see here is a Venn diagram showing to us the differences between biosafety and biosecurity and at the same time, these two also have similarities that bring them together. So biosafety and biosecurity individually, they are separate entities. But when you try to compare them, you can actually see some similarities between the two. Or for example, um, biosafety and biosecurity, they are the same in terms of access control, the personal management. You also have inventory of biological hazards proper decontamination and disposal of waste, and proper shipping procedures. But without these similarities, again, biosafety and biosecurity are separate entities. Continual improvement is one of the goals of a successful bio-risk management. As mentioned earlier, the continual improvement functions by the PDCA principle or the Plan, Do, Check, Act approach. These are the four components we need to remember to ensure continuous improvement, especially in our bio-risk management inside the laboratory. This slide defines the measures under each component of the PDCA principle. Remember PDCA principle? It is plan, do, check, and act. We have plan, which involves identification of potential for improvement or what area in the laboratory must be further improved. It also involves analysis of current situation and development of new concepts. Always remember that a successful outcome always depends on a well-planned action. Then we have do, which involves testing and optimization of new concepts by basic means at one working place. This is sort of the trial and error of the initial plan. Then we have act, which is the full implementation of the concepts which is periodically checked by the manager. And lastly, check, which involves careful checking of process and obtained results. If fully successful, then the measure will have a full approval as a standard process. Then if not, 
revisions must be done. Next, we have the Laboratory Bio-Risk Management AMP model. AMP stands for Assessment, Mitigation, and Performance. So based on the model, these three components should always be present to uplift the success of BRM. If one component is absent, an imbalance will occur resulting to the collapse of the system. In the identification of bio-risk, the first step is always to assess the situation. Biosafety and biosecurity assessments are done to evaluate the risk associated with biological agents and their toxins. After risks are already pointed out, then the mitigation step is put into place. Mitigation refers to the actions and control measures that are made to reduce or eliminate the risk. And lastly, we have the performance measures which evaluate and ensures that the system is working the way it was designed and identifies opportunities for system improvement. We now go to the further discussion of risk assessment. This topic encompasses risk identification and risk analysis. Risk assessment involves identification of the specific hazard or threat and knowing the consequences associated with the risk. For example, blood collection. The hazard or threat related to this procedure is more on being exposed to sharps hazards since needles are always used in collecting the blood sample. The consequences of this threat could be accidental punctures or contraction of bloodborne pathogens. In terms of identifying all the existing controls related to the risk, the medical technologist can opt for using sharps container that have grooves or using forceps to remove needles immediately after using. Recapping should not be done to avoid needle stick injuries. We also define some terms such as hazard, threat, and risk. Where hazard is an object that can cause harm, a threat is a person who has intent and or ability to cause harm to other people, animals, or the institution. And lastly, we have risk that can be based on either a hazard or a threat. For risk assessment, we need to have a detailed information regarding the involved pathogen, the lab procedure that was performed in isolating such pathogen, the skill level and vulnerability of the personnel performing the lab procedure. Was he wearing a complete set of PPE and was he using the correct laboratory facilities when he handled the specimen? Our infectious pathogens are classified into agent risk groups. We have four agent risk groups known. Our G1 are agents that do not cause disease to healthy adult human. Our G2 are agents that may cause disease to humans but not serious and can be prevented by therapeutic interventions. Our G3, on the other hand, are agents that can cause serious or lethal disease to human and with available therapeutic intervention. And lastly, we have our G4, which are agents that are likely to cause serious or lethal human disease, for which therapeutic interventions are not available most of the time. We also define risk, likelihood, and consequence. Risk is the incident involving the hazard. Likelihood is the probability that an event may occur and consequence is the effect of the risk or the severity of an event. We can also grade the likelihood for an event to occur. We can describe the likelihood of an event to occur as rare, having a grade of 1 to almost certain with a grade of 5. The same goes with consequence wherein we can grade the consequence from 1 to 5 with 1 as insignificant and 5 as catastrophic. For risk analysis, we can relate the likelihood of an event to occur to the consequence that may result from this event. For example, if you look at the table, the first column, this one, the first column lists all the descriptors for likelihood of an event from happening. And the succeeding columns, like this one, are the descriptors for the consequences. Here, we can conclude that as the likelihood of an event increases and the consequences or severity of the result also increases, there is a need for high-risk immediate action, especially if the consequence is catastrophic.
In all the levels for the likelihood of an event to occur, there is always high risk immediate action required, especially for catastrophic consequences as denoted by the red colored tiles in the table. The risk associated will always depend on the likelihood and the consequences of a certain event. So now, we have this um, following illustrations here that depict a perfect example for risk assessment involving the hazard, the risk, and consequences of the situation. So you have there on the first illustration, a laboratory scientist eating his hot dog sandwich and soda. One of the general laboratory rules is to never take your food inside the lab. Which leads us to the second illustration wherein one scientist is looking for his culture of amoebic dysentery which looks like that of a lemonade. Accidentally, he drank the culture instead of the lemonade resulting to the person being hospitalized which is the consequence as seen in the third picture. Another example is the use of needle for blood collection, which is considered as a sharps hazard, and the risk involves getting accidental punctures, which would result to the person acquiring the infection brought about by the hazard in the form of hepatitis B virus or other bloodborne pathogens. So, for our last example on risk assessment, uh, we have this one. Imagine a medical technologist culturing a bacterial sample inside the biosafety cabinet. The hazard involves the use of the Bunsen burner, which is a source, of course, of fire hazard, and the risk involved are the production of aerosols due to open flame, probably due to sterilization of inoculating loops or needles, and when placing Bunsen burners inside the biosafety cabinet, which is actually a bad practice. The consequences of these actions could result to inhalation of aerosols that may cause infection or worse, explosion of the biosafety cabinet. So based on the previous slide, we mentioned that aerosols can be produced inside the biosafety cabinet in the presence of open flame. But what are other activities inside the laboratory that can contribute to the production of aerosols? Actually, there are so many activities. So we have the following, pipetting, mixing, shaking. We also have centrifugation. Centrifugation um, of samples, when you want to um, stop uh, centrifugation of your samples, like you have to forcibly stop the spinning of your samples that alone can create or produce aerosols. We also have blending, vortexing, even pouring or transferring of one sample to another container. Um, these are some of the activities or laboratory procedures that can um, create aerosols inside the laboratory. So we go now to the second component of the AMP model for laboratory bio-risk management. So we now go to mitigation. So mitigation involves the following control measures that are put into place to reduce or eliminate the risk. We have elimination or substitution, um, engineering controls, administrative controls, practices and procedures, and the use of personal protective equipment. Among all the mitigation measure controls, PPE is the least in the hierarchy of mitigation measures, but it is the easiest to implement. So again, we have the AMP model for BRM or the bio-risk management, and we have the three main components of the model such as assessment, mitigation, and performance. So all of these are important for a successful bio-risk management system. In the hierarchy of controls, the different control measures for mitigation are ranked according to their effectiveness and level of difficulty in implementation. The goal of this hierarchy is to target the unacceptable risk. Unacceptable risks are those that cause severe harm as its consequence. Looking at the pyramid, elimination is ranked as the highest control measure characterized as the hardest to implement but the most effective. The opposite of that, and which is seen in the lowest portion of the pyramid, is the PPE, or the Personal Protective Equipment, which is easier to implement but the least effective of all the control measures. To sum it all, there is an inverse relationship between the level of difficulty in the implementation and the effectiveness of the mitigation measure.
So we have here the different uh, risk mitigation control measures and their corresponding definitions. Again, these control measures are ranked according to the difficulty of implementation and the effectivity of implementation. So we have elimination, and this is the most effective um, mitigation control, but it's the uh, hardest to implement. Okay, elimination involves removing the risk. Then we also have substitution. Substitution of a serious pathogen with one that is much less pathogenic. Then we have engineering controls. Physical changes in the workstations, equipment, materials, production facilities, or any other relevant aspect of the work environment that reduce or prevent exposure to hazards. We also have administrative controls that is pertaining to the policies, standards, and guidelines set by the management. Then we have practices and procedures such as processes and activities or laboratory procedures. And lastly, PPE, uh, which are devices worn by the worker to protect against hazards. So PPE, it's the most or the easiest uh, to implement, but it's the, le the least effective among all the risk mitigation control measures. So now, this table shows the different mitigation control measures we have discussed previously and the activities or lab equipment that are categorized under each mitigation control measure. What we can see is that for elimination measure control, it is indeed difficult to implement since it does not work at all. It is truly difficult to eliminate certain risk inside the laboratory and what must be done is only to minimize that risk to an acceptable level. So kindly familiarize the rest of the mitigation control measures and the activities under them so that you will have an idea um, of what are the things that you usually do inside the laboratory that are categorized or classified into the different uh, mitigation control measures. In the implementation of mitigation measures, the different control measures can be used together at once to effectively handle the risk. A combination of control measures should be used based on their effectiveness and the ability of the laboratory to implement them uh, must be put into consideration. So this only means that in order for you to completely eliminate the risk, you need not use only one mitigation control measure as much as possible. You need to use all the five mitigation control measures because if you only use one, that will not be very effective. So the hazard or the risk is still there and you need to completely deal with that. So if your laboratory can afford to have all the five mitigation control measures, then why not use it to its full extent? To understand mitigation control, take for example these two photos. One is about engineering control and the other is about the use of the personal protective equipment. If we compare these two vehicles, the people driving them have different approaches in avoiding road accidents. The car has built-in seat belts as well as safety balloons just in case road mishaps happen, whereas for motorcycles, Seat belts are of course not available to ensure the safety of the driver. The driver must wear safety gear such as helmet and knee pads to protect him. Again, there are different ways to mitigate the risk. Each of the mitigation control measure has its own advantages and disadvantages. For example, for engineering controls, its advantages include efficient elimination of hazards with significant reduction of the hazard potential. However, this mitigation control is costly and complex since using of machines is sometimes technical. For practices and procedures, although they are considered as standard approaches, people need to be trained and supervised by their managers. We also have the personal protective equipment which is easy to use, but its disadvantage includes the inability to remove the hazard. The hazard is just there, and you have your PPE for protection. So in order for an effective removal of the risk, there must be a combination of the different mitigation control measures. The personal protective equipment is considered as the last control measure in the hierarchy of controls. 
it is advised that this control measure should be used together with the others. But in many laboratories, it is the only available control measure, probably because the laboratory cannot sustain the other control measures due to financial constraints. So remember our chain of infection? It has many components that make it possible for an infection to occur if all these components are consistently linked to each other. Our goal is to always break the chain to avoid the spread of infection. So in this slide, we have the different components and how to prevent or mitigate each component. For example, for the pathogen, we can make use of a non-pathogenic microorganism or an avirulent strain for that matter. For the reservoir of the pathogen, we can eliminate the reservoir. Take for example, Legionella, which is a microorganism that can cause pneumonia-type illness. These bacteria are isolated from cooling towers like air-conditioned units. So how do we destroy the reservoir? We can clean the air conditioner units to prevent accumulation of these bacteria. For portal of escape or exit, we must prevent splashes or formation of aerosols because these are ways on how microorganisms escape the body and infect another person through inhalation. For susceptible host, mitigation control measures involves immunization among others. Acceptable risk is a risk exposure that is deemed acceptable to an individual, organization, community, or nation. In practice, risk often can be reduced to zero due to factors such as cost and secondary risk. Acceptable risks are often helpful when the, than the ideal that no risk is acceptable. The wow effect, which gives us the ability to justify our decisions, evaluate the impact of certain risk mitigation decisions, and compare the cost-effectiveness of various risk mitigation decisions. The last component of the AMP model for bio-risk management is performance. It includes control, assurance, and improvements. It constantly monitors and evaluates the mitigation measures to see that it is working as planned. Otherwise, a corrective action will be planned and implemented to protect the entire institution from biological agents and other corresponding toxins. The performance component is a constant cycle of identifying issues, defining outcomes and activities, data collection, acting on these findings, evaluating and refining the performance indicators. Now we proceed to biosafety culture. What is biosafety culture? It is an assembly of belief, attitudes, and patterns of behavior of individuals or organizations that can support complement or enhance operating procedures, rules and practices, as well as professional standards and ethics designed to prevent the loss, theft, misuse, and diversion of biological agents, related materials, technology or equipment, and the unintentional or intentional exposure or release of biological agents. There are three approaches involved in planting biosafety culture. We have the executive, the biosafety manager, and the end user who is usually a researcher. To practice the biosafety culture, the executive should have a wide and deep understanding what biosafety is for. With that, the executive must establish laws and regulations that will support its facility to have a biosafety level 2 or 3 kind of containment. This is only possible through continuous financial support since building a BSL 2 or 3 entails construction of the building and facility, purchasing of equipment like biosafety cabinets and autoclaves, validation and maintenance of equipment and facility, as well as education and training costs for the personnel. For researchers who are end users, it is important to have the skill to be able to work in a biosafety level 2 or 3 facility. A researcher with no idea about biosafety culture will prioritize biosafety less than research, will ignore biosafety regulations, lose confidence working in a BSL 2 or 3 facility, and will tend to hide accidents for fear of being punished by the supervisor. All of these acts are dangerous not only to the researcher but to the facility as a whole. To plant biosafety culture among researchers, 
the key is to immerse them in biosafety training so that they will have a grasp of, the, of what is it all about. Invite biosafety trainers or consultants, have lectures and film showings, and more trainings. In this way, the researchers will be motivated to conduct themselves in a manner that will ensure biosafety and biosecurity when performing their experiments. Another way of planting biosafety culture among researchers is to have a good communication. This can be done through emails or infographics that convey information about biosafety inside the lab. Always remember that punishment is not the solution and there should be trust between the researcher and the manager to ensure a good working relationship. The concept on safety culture is brought about by the efforts done by the management and employees. Both parties work together for the common good of everyone. When safety culture is practiced properly, everyone becomes aware and accountable with each other's safety. No one gets left behind. Also, the safety culture is perceived by employees as a reflection of the kind of management he or she is in. When the management takes time to improve the safety of its employees, then most likely the employees willingly participate in safety planning. When there are complete safety guidelines established, coupled with complete safety devices and protective equipment, then surely the employees would adhere to the rules and regulations. These actions remove their worries because even if they work in a hazardous environment, they have the assurance that they will be safe because protocols are in place and there are clear steps on what to do just in case accidents may happen. The following are the critical determinants of a successful safety program. First, we have the management's involvement in the safety program. It is only imperative that the management should be participative in safety programs because they are the ones who will relay their learning to their employees. Next, high status and rank for safety officers. A person who becomes a high-ranking safety officer should be equipped with the correct knowledge on how to run a safety program. Third, strong safety training and safety communications program. Trainings are significant in honing the skills and knowledge of people involved in a safety program. Experience is a good teacher and it expands your views in life. Next, there must be orderly operations or systematic steps to follow in a safety program. And lastly, an emphasis on recognizing individual safe performance than relying on punitive measures. Again, punishment is not the solution. Next, we have factors that influence a culture of safety. There are several factors involved such as the commitment of the management to ensure safety for everyone. We also have health workers who follow the rules and regulations set by the management. We also include methods of handling hazards in the work environment such as mitigation control measures, creating a feedback system to improve on the safety and increase awareness and promote individual accountability by assessing compliance to the practices or sign a pledge to promote a safe workplace. So what are some of the strategies to ensure organizational commitment to safety? We have the following. Include safety-related statements in the organizational mission, vision, values, goals, and objectives. This will give the employees relief that their safety is not taken for granted. Give high priority and visibility to safety committees, teams, and work groups. Examples are giving priorities to occupational health, infection control, quality assurance in the workplace, pharmacy and therapeutics, and most especially, waste care management. Lastly, require action plans for safety in ongoing planning process, modeling safe attitudes and practices. For example, there should be an action plan created to improve culture of safety for Sharps injury prevention, since this is one of the most common source of infection in the laboratory. This slide show shows you the different ways on how to convey safety inside the laboratory so that safety culture will be instilled in each lab personnel working inside a lab facility. The safety symbols can be an effective way of conveying that some of the equipment and samples we see in the laboratory are sources of many hazards and thus give us an idea of how to properly handle them 
while ensuring our own safety. We can also place photos of what a certain individuals would look like in a personal protective equipment to give us a glimpse that PPE is important in protecting the health worker from acquiring the infectious pathogen. Posters can also be seen anywhere inside the laboratory to refresh our minds about what to do and what not to do. Campaign posters can also be used to remind healthcare workers about the biosafety culture inside the laboratory. Just in case some would forget about it, there are daily reminders anywhere we look inside the laboratory. So to summarize everything that we have discussed about Bio-risk management, do not forget about the AMP model for BRM where A is for assessment, M is for mitigation, and P is for performance. So these three are important to ensure a successful bio-risk management system. Also, we need to remember that um, in terms of the mitigation control measures, which is one of the components of our AMP model for bio-risk management, um, it is not effective to only use one mitigation control measure. As much as possible, we have to make use of all the enumerated mitigation control measure to effectively remove the hazard or risk. Okay, so um, before we end this lecture, we have this um, saying here. We have this, be safe, be biosafe, be secure, be biosecure. So thank you so much for coming to our discussion today and I hope um, I'll see you next week for our next meeting.